good morning once again. We thank you for continuing to be ardent viewers and uh, subscribers, supporters of this Whispering Hope ministry, and specifically for the daily Sabbath school lesson review. I know that many of you out there always find it a uh, joy and intriguing to give comments, to learn, to give feedback upon the lesson study each and every day. Well, here we are again. We're in a brand new quarter, a brand new month, and the year is, is fastly disappearing. We're in October and we're looking at a brand new quarterly. And so we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes. But first, I want to just introduce as normal every Tuesday morning, our scholars who are on the panel with us to help us understand the Word of God for the particular topic that we're studying and to bring some insights uh, into what we can glean from the Word of God. This morning we have with us the always present and popular, beautiful Jacqueline Gordon. Elder Gordon, welcome. How has your week gone so far? So far, thanking God for life, His saving grace and His mercy. So I pray that one and all that we continue to be inspired, we continue to grow in the goodness, the fullness and the richness of God's love. Welcome everyone and good morning. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon. And this morning, folks, we have with us Elder Kem Tong. Now, Ke Elder Kem Tong is no stranger to Whispering Hope. Indeed, he was one of the initiators or first on the panel. And so we're happy to have Elder Kem that is fitting in this Tuesday morning for Elder David, who is away on assignments, taking care of some business. So we're so happy to have Elder Kem Tong with us this morning. Elder Tong, welcome once again. You're no stranger to Whispering Hope platform. Just greet the folks. And uh, how have you been doing so far? Oh, well, thank you, Elder Vaughan. Good morning, Elder Gordon. And good morning, uh, Whispering Hope family. I am doing well, Elder Vaughan. It's hot, but beside that, doing well by the grace of God. Happy to be with you again. Yes, indeed. It's very hot here in you know, neck of the woods. And I believe in most, most parts around the world, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, it's, it's pretty hot. So we give God thanks for all that he has provided. We got some rain, we got some, some cooling down, but, you know, we take the good with the bad because the rain falls on the roofs of everyone and also so does the sun. Uh, but we're happy to be here this morning once again to bring forth to you another study. We're going to move ahead right now and we're going to start with a word of prayer. For, we dare not ever enter God's word or try to understand God's word without first petitioning his throne for guidance and understanding. So I'm going to ask Elder Kem Tong to just give us a, a brief word of prayer as we open our study. And then after that, Elder Jacqueline Gordon is going to bring to us this week's memory text for us to look at. And the camera, go right ahead. Certainly, Elder Vaughan. Oh God, we thank you for giving us your word. We ask now that you make it a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet and teach us by the Holy Spirit of God so we may discern your will and walk therein. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And amen again. This week's memory text is taken from Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, reading from the New King James Version, and it reads, Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Thank you so much, Elder Kem, for that prayer, and Elder Jacqueline Gordon for bringing our memory text. We're looking at a brand new quarter, and you would have heard in the past few days, Monday and Sunday, that the title of the lesson for this quarter, the remaining three months in the year, it's God's mission, my mission. God's mission, my mission. We just looked at the book of Ephesians last quarter, but now we're looking at God's mission, my mission. And for this week, the lesson is entitled God's mission to us, part one. So therefore next week, we'll be bringing you God's mission to us, part two. And the memory text that Elder Gordon just read for us, it's coming from the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. And it's talking about the Lord calling out to Adam and asking him, where are you? Now I'm going to come back to you, Elder Gordon, because you would have read the text and have first bite at it. It's a very short verse, very short memory text. But in the scheme of things, we're talking about God's mission, our mission. Give us an overview or a synopsis, your understanding as to what God's mission is. And therefore, if we can understand what God's mission is, then we can understand what ours ought to be or should be. And put in context the memory text here about God calling out to Adam, where are you? If it links 
or how it links towards what we're going to be studying this quarter. I see this memory text loaded with the love, and mercy, and grace of God. And of course, it ties in with God's mission, and that is to seek and to save those that are lost. And when you understand the context here, that God created being, that fellowship, that union that they had in the Garden of Eden. And after sin, after disobedience, and they ran ahead from God, and we see a God of love, God of mercy, seeking after those who would have committed sin, seeking after those who would have turned their backs on him, seeking after those who seek to hide from the presence of God. And I think this is so powerful that it speaks to each and every one of us on a daily basis, recognizing that God's mission is to seek and to save those of us who are lost. All right, God's mission is to seek and to save those of us who are lost, Elder God. Thank you so much for that. Elder Kim, what is the purpose then, because if you're understanding that God's mission is to seek and to save those who are lost, what is our mission as God's children, as God's creation? You and me, when you look on the horizontal at, at, at those of us who are here on this terra firma, what is our mission then? Is it one and the same as what God's is? Well, absolutely, Elder Vaughan. Those of us who have been rescued by God uh, buy into his mission. And his mission is to seek and to save the lost. And so by extension, it becomes our mission to seek and to save the lost. All right, excellent. So now we get into Tuesday's lesson because Tuesday's lesson is entitled The God Who Became One of Us. The God Who Became One of Us. Now, Ella Kim, I'm coming to you right now. And it seems to me, us to others perhaps also, that it's a strange, very strange thing to do for a creator, the creator, to become one of his creation. For what reason, Elder Kem, for, for what purpose would a creator want to do that? I mean, he is all powerful, he's all mighty, he's the one who created us, but now he's going to sort of, uh, I guess, recreate himself <laughs> into one of us. Why, why would God want to do that and for what purpose? Very powerful question indeed, Elder Bon. I jot that down as a note in my study also. Why, you know, why would God want to save creatures who had basically rebelled against him? And in thinking about it, it goes back to who God is by nature and by character. We're learning that he is a missionary God, and out of that missionary spirit, or out of that loving spirit, he sets out to create us as an expression of, of that love that he has. And he created us really for relationships so that he could be with us forever. And so, irrespective of the fall, irrespective of the fact that we have rebelled, God, because of his nature, being a missionary nature because of, uh, of who he is. A missionary God says, in spite of that, I am still going to find a way, no matter the cost, no matter what I have to do, to restore you to the purpose of which I created you. That is so that I could be with you and you could be with me and we can be one. Excellent. Elder Gordon, God came and he became one of us. According to John the, the Revelator, the John, John the Disciple, John said that he became flesh and he dwelt among us. Some translations may put it that he actually pitched his tent among us. When Christ came and pitched his tent among us, what was the significance of him spending in his public ministry for say three and a half years going about in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas, what was the purpose? I mean, we know all Christians out there would know Christ came and died for our sins. We know Christ came and he died for our sins. But is there something else or other things that we could pull out or look at that Christ 
would have demonstrated or shown or for other maybe ancillary purposes that he came for here on this earth as he pitched this tent, tent against us or beside us. As we would have looked in the book of Genesis and recognized that the Genesis of sin as it relates to human beings, a promise was made when God would have seek after Adam and Eve, asking them where are they and to, to find out what has happened, what has gone wrong as, as it relates to them with the relationship that God once had with him. A promise was made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I'll read it from the King James Version. And it says, God says to them, to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So that's a promise that was made to the fallen human race back then. And the promise now was actually fulfilled in the incarnation of Jesus. So God fulfilled his promise. God could have stayed. One theologian said that God could have stayed in heaven and do what he had to do to save us. But no, because of the mission-driven God that he is, because of the love that he has for us, God came. And we know of the birth, the Virgin Mary, and we know that story when Mary, there was no room in the inn and all the rest of it. God identified with the lowest form of human being. I mean, we have heard of poverty. We have heard of discrimination. We have heard of so many things. There is no one out there on this planet that could have gone so low than what Jesus did. He was born in a manger. There was no room for him. There were animals all around him. You can imagine having a woman in this day age, elders, that is about to give birth. And then the husband or the midwife would carry her in an area where animals reside. You can imagine that. But yet still, our God, he stooped way down. And the idea was, the plan was, to save us. So he left the celestial glory of heaven where angels were bowing, were bowing to him, crying, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. But to save us, to show us the mission, to show us how much he loves us, he stooped low and he was born in a manger with cattle and all the things that were around just to save us, just to identify with us, come close with us, and as our lesson says, become one with us. That's the love of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Now, Elder Kem, we know of the narrative of Christ's birth. We know in the Gospels, they give us a certain narrative about the genealogy of Christ, where he came from, and it traces all the way back to Adam. But when we look at the accounts given in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, we see certain elements or certain qualities coming out there about the person, J Jesus Christ. Let me just read this for you, Elder Kim, and then the question I want to ask you is, could you identify or, and expound on certain essential things or certain essential qualities or traits that this passage is going to tell us about Jesus Christ. So Matthew 1, 18 to 23, I'll read from the King James Version. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was exposed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought of these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Elder Kem? 
Yes, Elevon, there are several powerful aspects to this passage. I begin with the first one, that his name, his name alone, Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, that in itself is so difficult to wrap your head around, that God then takes on flesh to come down to be with us. It, it's beyond understanding, it's beyond explanation that the God of this world would come so low, stoop so low, really, to become one with us. And then secondly, Elder Vaughan, I see the way that he comes into this world, you know, through the Holy Spirit placing him in the womb of Mary. And again, it just shows you to what length, to what extreme that God would go to fulfill his purpose, that missionary nature to fulfill his purpose of being one with us. That look, look at what he does, confines himself to a womb for nine months, you know, going through all that stuff, all because of his missionary nature, all because of his great purpose to be with us, which has always been his intention. And then, you know, it talks about how this fulfills the promise of God. And again, why should we have any reason to doubt God? When time and time again, he shows up, he shows us that his word is true. He shows us again and again that his intention is to be with us. He shows us that no matter the chasm that sin has created, I am relentless in my pursuit because the purpose for which I form you, that will obviously be accomplished. So those are some of the aspects that I would want to highlight at this point, Elder Paul. All right, thank you so much, Elder Kim, for that. Indeed, those are very pertinent aspects of who Christ is. And again, for me, it still baffles me. Well, I shouldn't say baffle, but in awe that a God of creation would, would become himself one of us and die in our place. That is the greatest act of love that can be, ever be displayed by anyone in this world. And it just behoves me. Um, Elder Gordon, we know Christ came in the flesh. But before that, before Christ came as a human being in the flesh, we see in the Old Testament that God wanting to be among his people. We see all through the sanctuary service where we had the, the Ark of the Covenant and the Shekinah glory, which represented the presence of God himself with the people. We saw that pillar of fire by day and the pillar of cloud by night. And we see the rock that followed them in the wilderness, according to scripture, that that was Jesus Christ himself. But now in the New Testament, Christ has come looking like me and looking like you. And he is living and walking and breathing and experiencing the things that human beings do. And he's very much close with us. Here's what John 1, 14 to 18 says. And a question for you after I read this text, this passage, Elder Gordon, is what can we learn from Christ's incarnation about God's mission? When we're talking about God's mission, my mission, or my mission, God's mission, and we're talking about mission towards people. Here's what John 1, 14 to 18 says. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. Verse 18 says, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. So, Elder Gordon, the question to you from that passage is, what can we learn about the incarnation of Christ? What does that tell us or informs us anything about the mission of God? So, a few things there. And I think we have been speaking about it since we started. The first and foremost is to express the love of God. You know, it has been said over and over again that you have, if you have a husband and wife or children within the home, and we just say to them, I love you, I love you, but yet still, we are doing nothing to show that love. 
You know, we women, we like tangible things. We don't want our husbands to just say, oh, I love you, I love you. Oh, didn't I tell you that last night? Or didn't I tell you this morning? Show me that you love me. Our children, they are the same. They're wired the same way. Just don't tell them you love them. Show them you love them. Love is a verb. It's an action word. It is not passive. It is active. I think Jesus, what God has done here is to amplify the word love by coming to us, identifying with us, take on the human nature. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. Uh, what did he go through? He's though we know the ultimate thing is his death look at his ministry he healed the sick he cleansed the leper he went through temptation 40 days and 40 nights he was persecuted he was insulted he went through everything there's nothing that we can identify today that affects humanity that god himself did not go through through his son jesus Jesus Christ. So what's the purpose? And we talk about being mission driven. The purpose is embodied in the word love. The purpose is to reflect how much God loves us. And, and we know that we know about the great controversy and none of us can fool ourselves. The Bible says the devil come to kill, steal and destroy. And many of us have suffered the onslaught of the devil. And when he, he has finished with us, beat us, battered us, us all he does is to go around and laugh at us who is there to rescue us as in the case of adam and eve only god that went out searching for them and say adam where are you and after making that promise our loving god fulfilled that promise by coming identify with us take on our human nature overcome temptation overcome hell death and the grave and that that promise especially as you read there in john only tells me that i serve a powerful god i serve a loving god and since his mission is to save me then my mission now is to go out and do as he had bid me to do so i can live and reign with him one day amen amen Elder Cam, this, this may seem a, a bit of a, a broad question, but do what you can with the answer. Here, here's a question. Looking at this quarter's lesson about the mission of God, and looking at specifically this week's lesson, and today about God becoming one of us, and the mission of God is to save mankind, what makes it practical or real for us to trust the Bible or the Word of God? Why should we trust what God says? I mean, Sister God might have touched on it, but why should anyone trust God? Is, is there something that he has done or failed to do or has always done that makes us want to trust God? It may be different angles. You may come at it, Elder Kim, but wh why should we trust God? So what's the basis? Absolutely, Elder Vaughn. And the way I like to come at it is, again, going back to Calvary, as Sister Gordon started, and looking at God. God in human body there, dying for us. I don't know that there is any greater evidence that we can come up with to trust God than seeing him high on a cross, spread wide, bleeding, bloody, battered, bruised. For us, Elder Vaughan, we who were, while we were still enemies, we, while we were yet without strength, we who had nothing in us that he desired we who rebelled against him and seen him there bled and died i don't know that there is any greater evidence that you can find to trust god than to look back at calvary and to see that what god says he lives out and that god is eternally eternally determined to bring us back into fellowship with him and that he's always had nothing but good intention for humanity. Excellent. And, you know, coincidentally, we just coming off of last quarter's study with Ephesians. And I believe one of the encapsulating points of Ephesians was God is uniting 
all of us, not just uniting us horizontally, but uniting us with him in heaven vertically. And so the thread of the message of the good news of Christ and the gospel, it runs through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we can see it if we open up our eyes and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, we can see it everywhere as we run through the Bible. And so as we, we study, yes, we're not studying a book this quarter per se. We're studying a theme or a topic. But we're going. To, I believe, elders, that we're going to be looking at a lot of revelation coming our way about the mission of God and how and why and where we fit in into that mission as we proceed in this quarter. It's for me an exciting time to well, it's always an exciting time to study the Word of God, but to discuss on this platform with others and to look at what we have ahead of us. We're moving close to the end of our discussion for this morning, and we're looking at now the latter part of the study. And the question comes to us that says, think what it means that God's love for us is so great that he would come to us in our own humanity. How should we respond to this love, especially in terms of, of mission to others. Now, this question is for you, Elder Gordon. I'm going to have Elder Kem give his contribution as well. But let me just say this before you answer the question, Elder Gordon. When we think about evangelism, we think about having one-on-one -on -one studies of the Bible or caring for someone or leading someone to make a decision for Christ. We look at pitching perhaps a tent or having some great forum where we have large numbers of persons come out and we use a quote-unquote a dragnet to bring these people into the kingdom of God to educate them, to teach them, to show them the way of Christ, and they will then make a decision for Christ themselves. But when we talk about mission now, mission, you, you don't hear a lot of people saying, oh, I'm a missionary for oh, God. <laughs> you hear more often, no, oh, I'm an evangelist, or he's an evangelist, so we're going to have an evangelistic crusade. But when we talk about mission, I remember some time ago, a pastor talked about mission to Chinese that live in the Caribbean, in, in your own backyard. And, and there's a particular mission in turn that you actually live with them or spend time with them in their own culture, in their own yard, in their own space. And you try and understand the dynamics of their family and you try and exchange your culture and so on and so forth. So there seems to be, Elder Gordon, a bit of a, a difference between mission and evangelism. But the question, getting back to the question before I confuse you, the question is saying, how should we respond to this love, the love of Christ coming to live among us and dying for us? How should we come here, respond to this love of Christ, especially in terms of mission to others? And to underscore the word, the mission to others. How should we respond to the love of Christ? With mission well, first and foremost, we must accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That personal relationship with God is absolutely important. It is very important for us to first accept Jesus as Christ, as our Lord and Savior, and accept what he has done for us and be determined to go and do. As you're making those things, I was listening to you keenly. And the days when we talk about mission and going far, and beyond. But God is so good. We are now affected with globalization. We are, uh, every, each and every society right now is not as indigenous as it was back then, but our neighbor, just to talk about the Chinese and all, all culture, we can find them around us these days. So the time to say go far and wide, God is so good. He has brought it close to us right now. So I believe missionary evangelism, whatever they call it, is very, very good especially when it's done one-on-one. -on -one. You meet someone daily and you can guide them, even by lifestyle. Lifestyle is also very, very important. So as we go out and do God's work, as we determine to be his missionary, I would like to close by reading just a sentence here, two sentences from Christ's Object Lesson, Sister White herself. She's from Christ's Object Lesson, page 314. And she says, this is the power because we need the power to do God's bidding. It's not by might, nor by power, but by the spirit. Sister White is saying to us, this power is not in human agent. We cannot do it within ourselves. It is the power of God. When a soul 
receives Christ, he receives the power to live the life of Christ. So I would like to close with the spirit of prophecy where she outlines that yes, I would like to be mission driven as Christ. Yes, I receive him, but I don't want to be passive. I want to go to do his will. I am reminded that he's not in human agent, but he's all embodied in Jesus himself. And once each and every one of us surrender daily Christ will give us that power to live the life that counts and to tell others, whether by lifestyle or by verbally, we must tell them that Jesus is coming soon and he loves us with an everlasting love. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Elder God. Elder Kim, you want to weigh in on that final question about how should we respond to the, the love of Christ in terms of our mission to others? Well, one, I think the Holy Spirit has set that out for us in very clear words. If we would just permit me to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and on, and quite in concert with what Elder Gordon was saying. The text there says, for Christ's love, notice the fact that the Elder Elders, for Christ's love constrains or compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So there it is, Elevon, both the call into his mission and both the response to his love. And then he says further on, so from now on, we, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And then in verse 18, he says, all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation, the mission that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed unto us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So it's clear, Elder Levon and Elder Gordon, it is clear in his mission, he has rescued us and redeemed us. And he has, by that rescue and redemption, in turn made us missionaries after the same purpose and the same order as him. I noticed two features of his mission, of his activity in, in the way he carries out his mission. Number one, uh, he came, he went to those whom he would wish to save. And that's that's for us. We have to go to those who would want to see saved. We can't sit by and wait for them to come. We are out there every day. We have to be intentional about going to them. And secondly, as Sister Gordon would have mentioned, he became one with them, or Elder Vaughan. It's important. <laughs> we have to become one with those whom we want to see safe and so it is compelling the love of god that's where it all starts with the love of god he's a missionary god at heart and we by reason of being redeemed by being rescued are bound up with him in his mission excellent folks that's where we're going to leave it for today I believe that was a profound summing up there, Elder Kem, and to Elder Gordon as well for contributions made towards our final question on today's study. We looked at the God who became one with us. Not just one of us, but he became one with us. There's a significant difference in that I can be among persons. I can be in the same congregation. I can be in the same space. But my mindset is not with them. My caring and my love for them is not with them. But God became one with us. And so we are profoundly blessed to be, as Ephesians would have told us, in heavenly places with Christ. And so I want to thank you for continuing to view with Spring Hope and continue to study the Word of God. Let God be your guide and your light. Let Him be the captain of your ship. As we launch out into this new quarter, we pray that as we go through and coming to the end of this year, that we all will draw closer to Christ. Until next time, may God continue to bless you. Special thanks once again to Elder Cameron and Elder Jacqueline for being with us on this Tuesday morning study. 
Have a wonderful day. Until next time.